Automation systems rely on sensors, actuators, and controllers to automatically adjust and meet a set point. Today we're going to be talking about a control actuator for the temperature control lab, the heater, the resistor heaters. Uh, they're just right here in the back. All right, these uh, two resistor heaters. And then the sensor is right here at the front. We're going to be talking a little bit more about these actuators and also relate that to pumps and valves that are common in chemical process control. If you'd like to follow along, here is the link. And it has all of this material along with some of the source code that we're going to be using to do some heater uh, step tests. So we have a TIP31C. That's the type of uh, power transistor that we're using for our actuator. Uh, these are uh, NPN uh, bipolar junction transistors. And it's in this package TO220. 220, so it just means it's uh, without the heat sink there. It's in this uh, type of package. Um, they're commonly used as, uh, in power audio and on-off switch applications, but not commonly as heaters. All right. Uh, well, if we were to do this uh, project with a MOSFET transistor, then it has very low power consumption across that, and then you'd need something like a resistive power heater uh, resistor that would go along with the MOSFET. Uh, we just use this one uh, because the BJT has uh, quite a bit of power loss, uh, heat dissipation that just goes from its own switching. So this little pin right here is the base. And then we have our collector and emitter. All right, and that is a, a transistor. So basically, this is our switch that turns this on or off. And then this is uh, the flow of electricity that uh, would then flow through the collector and emitter. So it's kind of like a valve. If we uh, thought about it like a valve, this would be our base. And then we have our collector and emitter. And the base opens up or closes this uh, this control valve. Uh, and, uh, we're using this as an analogy. Uh, and these are common in chemical process control. So you have a control valve, not one where you see a manual turn valve on it. But this one is controlled uh, by a computer signal or by pressure signals uh, if it's analog or digital. Now, um, we also have uh, the analogy of a pump. In this case, this is a centrifugal pump. You might have a variable frequency drive. Or more common is just to have a pump, and then the valve controls the pressure drop or the flow. And that's similar to what our power supply is here. That is providing the, the voltage supply for this uh, system so that we get uh, the power dissipation across the transistor. All right, so there's a little bit more information here on uh, the, uh, you know, the, how, how it works. Uh, we don't turn on the heater to, let's say, 50%. What we do instead is we rapidly cycle between 0 and 100%. And for an Arduino, that can get up to 500 hertz or every 2 milliseconds. We turn that on or off. And we send a signal that's between 0 and 255, or that is 2 to the 8th discrete levels that are uh, represented by integers. OK, so if we were to turn on, for example, Q1 to 65%, that might mean that we are going on for about 65% of the time, uh, and then 35% uh, of the time we're off. Okay, and then we can adjust both for Q1 and Q2, a certain percentage of the time that's on and that gets translated into a pulse width modulation signal. Uh, it's a pulse width modulated to have uh, represent an analog output with a digital output. So the Arduino outputs on or off, and it's 
about 20 millivolts and it's about 0.7 of the supply voltage which is 5 volts so that equals 3.5 volts uh, sorry milliamps here uh, 20 milliamps for the current and that is going to our base and then the collector emitter that's um, the power supply that you have that you plug in to the wall and then you plug in the USB to your uh, Arduino barrel jack that provides uh, the current that goes through the collector and emitter alright so here's the uh, code that we have that controls the heaters will import TC lab uh, will connect to the lab and then we'll set Q1 to 65 we'll sleep for a period of time set Q2 to 85 sleep again and then close the lab alright so uh, what we want to do with this information is develop a model for our second heater and temperature sensor previously we had developed one for the first heater and temperature sensor and so now we want to do it for the second one um, the information that we need for this is uh, you know we have these two heaters and they're set to different power levels in the Arduino firmware or in the MATLAB uh, program so it's by design that they have different power so when the heater one is set to a hundred percent a signal of 200 out of 255 which are 2 to the 8th discrete levels that's sent to the Arduino and when heater 2 is set to 100 percent a signal of 100 out of 255 is sent to the Arduino and so that's half the power of heater 1 so let's take this information and see if we can develop a first order plus dead time model and test it just to see how well we're predicting just from this information about the transistor heater and its uh, maximum level so if we come to uh, the code here at the bottom of the page we can either do the basic or the animated I'm gonna go ahead and do the animated version the basic will work in a Jupyter notebook the animated You'll have to make some modifications to it if you want to put it in a run a Jupyter notebook so it doesn't produce a, a lot of plots there. Um, okay, I'm going to just copy this and then I can open up IDLE. All right, and do file, new file, and then save this. And then I'll just save it to my desktop. So I'm going to call this heater2.py. Now, one of the things I need to do with this is fill in the model for heater2. I already have my heater1 model right here. I'm going to open this up actually with Notepad++ just to have a little bit bigger text here. All right, so we have heater1.9. 175 and 15. We're, so we're familiar with this from uh, either graphical or regression fitting, or we could have gotten that model from uh, linearization of the nonlinear model. So we had uh, this is going to be half of the gain of KP1. So I could do something like KP1 divided by 2 as well. All right, and uh, the time constant is going to be the same and then the theta p uh, that will also I'll say that's going to be the same as well so the only thing I needed to do is just adjust the maximum power that it can output and these other parameters if you look at the first the physics based modeling those are more dependent on the thermal mass and its heat transfer coefficient so those are the same for both of them the only thing that's different is how much power is output. I'll save this and then let's run this as a program. All right, I'm going to go ahead and try this with. All right, and it'll start uh, running. And while this is going, I'll show you just a little bit more information about uh, the transistor heater. All right, so we have uh, Q1 and Q2. You can see it's starting just a little bit colder. It's trending up because it thinks that the ambient temperature is 23 uh, degrees C 
which it isn't. Uh, but let's uh, uh, turn on Q2 to 50% uh, and uh, just do some steps here uh, with different levels. We'll see how well that tracks. We had 15 seconds of delay. It turned on at 10 seconds. You can see the model for T2 is starting to come up here. All right, and uh, it's trending up. And so we'll let this run for a little while uh, while we discuss some additional things about our actuator. All right, so if I come back over here, uh, the other thing I wanted to share with this is the spec sheet for the power transistor. Uh, now, this is from On Semiconductor. Uh, you can find specs from various uh, you know, manufacturers of things like pumps or valves. It'll show you curves, uh, pump curves uh, you know, for head loss or for valves. It'll show you uh, all of the specifications that you'll need for that. And in this case, this is a spec sheet for our actuator. So if we have um, an NPN, okay, the base, as we mentioned, this is our switch right down here that uh, allows the current to flow. Okay, so this is our base, and then this is our collector and emitter. All right, and so we have collector and emitter. Four is also part of the collector. It's uh, connected to that, so you can you know, put it down on a printed circuit board and uh, connect uh, this part of it, okay, if, uh, if needed. All right, and then just a little bit more information about some of the voltage um, and current values uh, that you have. You know, typically to turn on this this base, you need 0.5 to 0 0.7 volts just to make it turn on. So for the Arduino, uh, we're outputting 3.5 volts and about 20 milliamps. All right, is the is the maximum that we get out of the Arduino when we turn it on or off. So that is above the, the threshold, the cutoff uh, threshold, and so it allows the current to flow from the collector uh, to the emitter and uh, heat up that transistor. Okay, just a couple other things you'll see um, some of the electrical characteristics, and then we also have some. Uh, some correlations between uh, the temperature and the power dissipation. So um, we can have, you know, as we go up in temperature, we can have less uh, power dissipation. So that can be, uh, you know, a, another factor. We could include some of these things just as the as part of our model if we were doing a physics-based model, but it's fairly linear in the in the region that uh, that we deal with. Uh, okay, and so here are a few more other specifications for the the transistor. All right, so let's go back and just see how this is trending. All right, looks like it's just a little bit uh, cooler in here, so uh, the the uh, or a little bit offset between what we would expect, um, you know, in terms of our measured value versus what we're predicting, which is uh, higher. Let me go over to our uh, one other run that I had on this. I'll just show you the, um, okay, let's see if I've got that in my folder. Okay, it looks like I don't have that. I was going to show just another run where I was in a room that was just a little bit warmer and they were lining up uh, just a little bit better. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause it at this point and then we'll come back once this is about done. All right, at this point, uh, the second, we have the uh, heater one that's turned on for a little bit. I just did a little step here on this one. You can see the natural temperature rise here just because it uh, thinks that T2 is hot, so it's going to heat up T1, even though heater 1 is off. And then we just turn it on for a little bit here. You're going to see this rise just a little. So it's continuing to track. You can still see this offset. You know, I don't like the offset there. Let's go ahead and just stop it and try it again, but put in the correct 
ambient temperature instead of uh, 23 degrees. So I'm just going to stop this um, running and go ahead and close the application. And then I'm just going to set the steady state condition to about 16 uh, instead, or 16.5. I think it was around, uh, right around there. And then let's try it just one more time. And I'll go ahead and run it even uh, without letting it cool off. So let's see how well it does uh, predicting uh, this. I'm just going to, it initializes to those uh, the starting points. And then I just updated the ambient temperature condition. Um, all right, and uh, you can see it's starting to cool off here. And then we just turned on the heater two uh, one more time. So we should see it start to rise after 15 seconds in terms of our prediction. Okay, so you can see it's gonna rise. I'll go ahead and pause it here. Let's see if we're a little bit closer, just updating the ambient temperature. So it looks like this is doing a little bit better job of tracking uh, temperature two. Uh, versus, you know, and over time, you could see temperature one still not tracked very well. There's no effect in the model, um, you know, in these first order plus dead time models. There's no effect of, you know, the one temperature based on the the transistor heater temperature that's next to it. So there's no multivariate effects in the model, and so that's why. You know, temperature one is not going to ambient temperature, but it's feeling the effect of heat uh, from temperature two. But overall, a better uh, fit by updating the ambient temperature. I'll just let this run just a little longer. Okay, this is done. It looks like it has a much better fit now to uh, temperature two. Uh, and we used the information that we had from the transistors and the signal that was being output, knowing that it's about half the power that's dissipated over heater two versus heater one. And uh, so we uh, just derived that just from knowing what we put into the firmware and derived a new model. Okay, so our next, uh, next exercise is gonna be about the sensor. This was about the actuator, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the sensor as in the next exercise.